Hi, and uh, welcome to this St. Luke's community event. Uh, my name is Tim Fendler, and I am a heart failure cardiologist. I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, things you need to know about this disease we call heart failure. Uh, I want to mention uh, briefly here at the beginning that if you have questions throughout my talk, please uh, feel free to ask them in the chat box. And uh, about a week after this presentation, we'll get copies of slides to everybody who listened in, and I'll answer those questions in that week and get those answers out to all of you. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about what heart failure is and how we treat it. Uh, but before we do that, I think it's important we talk about how a normal heart works. Uh, one of my med school professors when I was a medical student always used to say we need to learn normal before A, B normal. Uh, and that always stuck with me. Uh, so we're going to kind of start by going back to school a little bit here this morning. So I hope you're all uh, ready to learn a little bit. So let's start by talking about our circulatory system. Uh, we know uh, that the heart and the blood vessels are the components of the circulatory system whose job is to circulate blood throughout the body. And this is a closed loop circuit. So uh, starting with number one that you see there on the graphic on your uh, right, we know that blood returns to the heart through vessels called our veins. And those are uh, depicted here as blue vessels because they are free of any oxygen, the fuel that our body uses. They've been, the oxygen's been taken out by the parts of the body. So that blood returns to the right side of the heart, uh, the right-sided chambers, and then the right-sided chambers sends that blood up uh, over to the lungs uh, through the pulmonary artery. And those lungs then refuel the blood with oxygen. We breathe in air with oxygen in it, and that oxygen goes from our airways into those blood vessels, refueling the blood. Uh, and now that refueled blood is ready to be sent out to the body again so that all the body parts can get another round of oxygen, of fuel. So now that refueled blood full of oxygen goes back through the pulmonary veins to the left-sided chambers of the heart. And then it's the left-sided chambers of the heart that send the blood out through the arteries. Those are the vessels that carry blood from the heart to the body parts that's full of oxygen. Uh, and the left ventricle, the bottom left-sided chamber of the heart, is really the muscular workhorse of the heart who takes on most of the responsibility of the heart of pumping that blood forward. And that uh, oxygenated blood then gets to our body parts where we can use the oxygen in our cells as fuel to perform uh, our daily duties uh, depending on which body part we are. Um, so we're going to focus in a little bit on the heart, which obviously is uh, the organ that I'm the most interested in. Uh, and that I think is the most important. So how do our hearts work? Uh, I oftentimes tell patients that the easiest way to think about their hearts is that the heart is sort of like a house. Any of you out there in the audience who are engineers or architects uh, will understand some of this verbiage a little more. So first we have the infrastructure or the architecture of the heart itself. This is the brick and mortar, the walls and the roof, the, the parts of the heart. So the heart has these four chambers that you can see here. Um, when we look at pictures of the heart, oftentimes the convention is that what's on the right in our body is on the left in the picture, and what's on our left in the body is on our right in the picture. So just remember that throughout this talk. So you see that uh, on the uh, left side of your picture are the right-sided chambers of the heart, the right atrium on top and the right ventricle below. And on the left side of the heart, which is the right side of your picture in red, are the left-sided chambers, the left atrium on top and the left ventricle below. The walls of these chambers are made up of heart muscle, and it's that muscle that squeezes and contracts to send blood forward from one chamber into the next through a valve or from a chamber into an artery or a vein. So after we talk about the architecture, the infrastructure, the brick and mortar of our heart, the anatomy of the heart, we get into the actual function of the heart. And for this, we're going to use uh, what is often used as engin in, in engineering terms, MEP, mechanics, uh, electric electrical system, and plumbing. So starting with the mechanics of the heart, the heart has what we call a, a cardiac cycle, and it has two parts. Uh, there is the squeezing part of the heart muscle cycle, and there's the relaxing part of the heart muscle cycle. Other words you'll sometimes hear us use as cardiologists is the pumping part, that's the squeezing part, and the filling part, that's the relaxing part of the heart cycle. Uh, the medical terms for these parts of the heart cycle, which you can see in the graphic on this slide, are systole, when the heart chamber's muscle squeezes and pumps blood forward, either into the next chamber or out into a blood vessel 
And the other component of that cycle is diastole. That's where the heart chambers relax, the bottom heart chambers, and allow blood flow in, filling of blood the next time. After we talk about the mechanics, we should probably talk about the plumbing. And when we talk about the plumbing of the heart home, we're referring to what we call the coronary arteries. And you've probably heard of these before because you've probably heard of coronary artery disease before. So these coronary arteries are the heart's own blood supply. The heart's job is to send blood and oxygen to all the parts of the body by pumping it forward, but it needs its own blood and oxygen supply to stay healthy and continue to do that job well. And finally, we get to the electrical part of the heart as a home. So our electrical conduction system is made up of nerve, of, of nerve fibers that can conduct electrical impulses and those nerve fibers run through the walls of the heart muscle. Uh, and you can see that in this picture here depicted in yellow. Uh, so those impulses are generated at a small node in the upper right chamber of the heart, the right atrium, and those are generated before every single beat of your heart. They have been since you were first formed inside mom's belly. And before each beat of the heart, that electrical impulse spreads through the upper chambers and causes them to beat to send blood from the upper chambers to the lower chambers. And then that same electrical impulse spreads through the walls of the lower chambers to, to help them uh, pump blood out to the lungs on the right side and out to the body on the left side. Our heart beats about 60 to 100 times a minute, and it's been doing that ever since you were first born. And each beat is preceded by one of these electrical impulses. The EKG or ECG or electrocardiogram that you often get done when you go to the doctors and you can see a version of an ECG tracing in the upper right of this slide is a way that we can look at that electrical conduction system. We read these EKGs kind of like we read a map and we can look for patterns that tell us about abnormalities in that conduction system. So now that we've gone through uh, an idea of how our hearts work normally, we're going to move on to how our hearts can malfunction. Or as my medical school professor would say, uh, we're going to move from normal to AB normal, abnormal function. Uh, so we're going to keep with this idea that the heart is like a house, and we know that parts of the house can break down at any time. So when we talk about the infrastructure or the mechanics, the walls of the heart muscles can become weak or they can become stiff, they can get thickened. The heart chambers, which are like the rooms of the house, can become weak or dilated and stretched out. The valves that act like doors between the rooms can become stiff and not let blood flow through as readily as it would like to, or they can become leaky and when the chamber squeezes, blood goes backwards through the system, through those leaky valves. When we think about the plumbing system, the coronary arteries, which are like the pipes, they can get clogged or narrowed by cholesterol plaques, and that is what coronary artery disease refers to. Uh, and those pipes can get suddenly blocked if one of those cholesterol plaques ruptures, which happens spontaneously, and the body tries to contain that rupture with blood clot forming at the site, and that's what happens when people have heart attacks. And when we talk about malfunctioning of the electrical system of the heart, there can be a loss of electrical signals, or signal or shortages that occur, and the heart can forget to beat, so people can develop blocks in their heart. They, their heart slows down, or those signals aren't passed to cause the heart to squeeze enough times a minute. Or there can be too much excitement or stimulation of the electrical system, and the heart can then have abnormal or abnormally fast rhythms that can be dangerous or cause symptoms. When we talk specifically about the idea of heart failure as a disease. Heart failure can really occur when any parts of the house break down. There's no one thing that leads to heart failure. Um, what I do want to say before we talk more about what can cause heart failure is that heart failure is a poorly named condition and, and that's on us. That's our fault as the medical community. Because the reality is when people have congestive heart failure, the heart hasn't actually failed. It's not beyond repair. This isn't an irreversible problem or a terminal condition. The way I describe this to patients is that when a person is in congestive heart failure, it means that the heart is currently failing to keep up with the demands that the body is placing on it at that given time. And the good news about reframing the concept of what heart failure is as failing at a certain time to keep up with the needs of the body uh, is that we can get out of heart failure. Uh, again, as a medical community, we've kind of failed our patients because we've yet to come up with a better term. And this one's kind of seeped into uh, public awareness. So it's hard to get rid of a, of a label like this. But just remember that heart failure is not as bad as it sounds. Um, 
if the heart is failing to keep up with the demands of the body at any given time, like I said, that means that we can both go into heart failure, develop heart failure symptoms, but it also means more promisingly, promisingly that we can get out of heart failure. Um, so while some of us or some of you in our audience today may carry a diagnosis of congestive heart failure, Patients who have heart failure do not have to live their lives in heart failure. And so the goals of treatment of heart failure have to do with extending life and improving chance of survival, yes, but also feeling better and improving your day-to-day -day quality of life so that heart failure doesn't cause uh, you to feel worse and limit what you can do as your life goes on. The goal then, once symptoms are, have gone away, is to prevent them from coming back, keep them away, keep people out of heart failure. So just an important way to think about this uh, title, this diagnosis, and, and the way that maybe it's a little bit more menacing sounding than it is in reality. So back to what causes heart failure. Well, like I mentioned, there are lots of different ways that the heart home can break down, and many of those different ways, many of those different heart diseases or problems can lead to symptoms of congestive heart failure. So I like to say that heart failure is the final common pathway of a number of different disease processes. Or to use the phrase, all roads lead to Rome. So all heart conditions, if left untreated or if they progress, can eventually cause heart failure. So with that in mind, we should think of the fact that there are two parts of the heart cycle, like we mentioned earlier when talking about the mechanics of the heart. And both of those parts of the heart cycle can cause or lead to heart failure. So the relaxation of the heart muscle, that thing I called diastole, that part of the heart cycle can be a problem when blood is flowing into the heart chambers as they relax. But also squeezing of the heart muscle, that thing I called systole, that can also be a problem when the heart's squeezing to pump blood forward. So because there's two parts of the heart cycle, there are two main ways that people can develop congestive heart failure. One is that the heart muscle stiffens, and then it can't relax well enough to let blood in during diastole. We call that diastolic heart failure. Or there can be a problem where the heart muscle itself weakens. The heart can no longer squeeze as strongly as it used to, and it can't squeeze well enough to push enough blood and oxygen forward to the body. We call that systolic heart failure. Now, whether you have a stiff heart that doesn't let blood fill appropriately, or you have a weak heart that doesn't squeeze blood forward appropriately, the result is kind of the same. Uh, it's a backup in the system, basically. So not enough blood going forward, and the resulting backup of blood congests the system. And that is really what heart failure is caused by. So what does heart failure actually look like? What are the symptoms that come about because of poor forward flow and congestion from too much backup of flow? Well, here on this slide are symptoms dis divided by those two things. Symptoms of decreased forward flow when not enough oxygen is getting to the body parts are that patients with heart failure feel fatigue. They have loss of energy. They can also lose their appetite and find that they tr when they try to eat, they get full too early. Uh, and that's because the uh, blood vessels that supply our bowels and our intestines that help to absorb food don't get enough oxygen to the intestines, so they can't do their job very well. The blood pressure can drop because our blood pressure is made up of how well the heart squeezes and how much the blood vessels tighten. And when the heart gets weak, we can't mount as much blood pressure. That can lead us to get things like lightheaded. And then when we talk about symptoms of fluid backup or fluid retention and the congestion that occurs in the body as a result of that backup of fluid, we know that people get short of breath or they have coughing. And that shortness of breath will be worse when they try to do things. Those symptoms come because fluid builds up in and around the lungs. We also know because fluid builds up in the lungs that people have trouble laying down flat or they wake up in the middle of the night short of breath and needing to sit up and catch their breath. We also know that as you get congested in and, and, and gain water weight, you gain weight as well. And so people will see their weight go up on the scale even if they're not eating more. And that kind of weight is shown in the fact that the legs get swollen, our socks get too tight. Now there is some kind of swelling in the legs I wanna mention that's okay and normal. And that's the kind that get, comes throughout the day but is gone after we've slept all night uh, at night. Uh, and that we call dependent edema. That's sort of one of those glories of aging, something that is okay, even though it may not be cosmetically your favorite thing. But when people have heart failure, they get leg swelling that doesn't go away day or night. We can also get abdominal bloating, and sometimes patients will notice that their pants that used to fit are starting to get too tight. 
So this is kind of what heart failure looks like. These are the symptoms that make up the diagnosis of congestive heart failure. And I think the three most common ones that I hear and that I highlighted here are fatigue and shortness of breath and, and then leg swelling. But each patient can look different. And so I think that brings up an important idea that it's good to remember the, what we call the faces of heart failure. This was a, a, a public ad campaign to raise awareness about heart failure. And I think it's a nice mnemonic device that we can think of. So faces, the F is for fatigue, the A is for activities being limited, the C is for chest congestion, a sense of fullness in the chest from that fluid accumulation. The E is for edema, which is a medical word for swelling of the ankles. And then the S is for shortness of breath. It's important to remember that because so many different things can cause heart failure, anyone can go into congestive heart failure, whether they be old or young, whether they be male or female, no matter what their race. Um, and so while we know there are certain populations that are more at risk for heart failure, it can happen to anyone. And so it's important to recognize, so you can remember to think the faces of heart failure when you're remembering what the symptoms are that, that can be associated with heart failure. So a couple of boring facts about heart failure because the slide, a uh, talk like this should always have a slide like this. Heart failure is a really common condition and it seriously affects people's lives and their quality of life and their longevity. Uh, by the numbers, it affects over six and a half million Americans uh, with a lifetime risk for all of us of one in five. So about a 20% risk of developing heart failure for all humans alive in, in America. Um, and like I mentioned, it causes significantly worse quality of life uh, due to inability to control symptoms. And so those symptoms can make you feel poorly from day to day, make it hard to enjoy the things you want to enjoy in your daily life. Uh, heart failure is the most frequent cause of admission to the hospital in people over the age of 50 because people who have heart failure, they can go out of it. But when they go back into it, which we call a flare or a decompensation, uh, they oftentimes need to be hospitalized to get it back under control. And Probably one of the most important things we know about heart failure is that having it reduces your chance at a normal lifespan. So uh, what are the things that put people at risk for heart failure? So this is talking about people who haven't been diagnosed with heart failure before, but who may have things that make the likelihood of developing heart failure higher. And so these are people where we need to be more careful about controlling things. So some risk factors that are very common, high blood pressure, which we call hypertension, high blood sugar levels, which we call diabetes, and high body weight, which in medicine we call obesity. And there are various other uh, causes or conditions associated with higher likelihood of developing heart failure. If you have heart attacks, which in the medical world we call myocardial infarctions or MIs, uh, that can lead to weakening of the heart muscle and heart failure. If you have heart valve disease, uh, stiffening or leakiness of valves. If you develop viral infections of the heart, which are exceedingly rare and that I don't want you to be overly worried about. We know that this can happen with COVID. You've heard of COVID myocarditis. It is a very, very rare thing. And it is very, very rare with all of the viruses that cause the common colds in America. But that is something that can cause the heart muscle to weaken. There's also genetics. So the DNA that you're born with, whether it is a newly mutated part of your DNA when you're formed inside mom's belly, or whether it is an abnormal part of your DNA sequence, your genes that's passed down from mom or dad. These can predispose people to weakening of the heart muscle over time. And finally, toxins, things like alcohol or drugs or chemotherapy, some chemotherapy that's used to treat certain kinds of cancer. These things can cause toxicity to the heart that can cause it to weaken. So uh, probably one of the most important questions when we think about things that make you at risk for heart failure is how do we prevent heart failure? How can each of you do your best to make sure you're not one of those one in five who develops heart failure? So, we always say it's important to know your own numbers. You know, you get a lot of tests done, you get vital signs done when you go to the doctor. We wanna know those and we keep track of those, but we advocate that all of you keep track of those too because we want you to be a part of your healthcare. We don't want you to be a passive participant on the train. We want you to be driving the car that is your health. And we're in the passenger seat trying to help steer. So it's important to know what goals are for certain numbers. So your blood pressure, we like the top number to be less than 130 and the bottom number to be less than 80, ideally. Body mass index, which is a way to incorporate both your weight and your height. Uh, and it's a way that we measure weight uh, and how we control for height because a really tall person is gonna be heavier, right? So a BMI less than 25. Cholesterol, we want your total cholesterol less than 200. We aim for an LDL, that's what we sometimes call the bad cholesterol of less than 100. And an HDL, which we call the good cholesterol, uh, higher than 45. And then the hemoglobin A1C, this is a test that we use to screen for diabetes. 
In a diabetic patient, we want the hemoglobin A1C less than 7% with good control of diet and medicines if needed. And for patients who are not yet diabetic or who are pre-diabetic, we like the A1C to be less than 5.7%. And finally, a number called the ejection fraction, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, that has to do with how well the heart is squeezing. And we aim for a goal normal ejection fraction. And normal is greater than or equal to 55%. And like I mentioned, we'll get, we'll get more to that later. But it's good for you to know these numbers and keep track of them over time. So how do we actually diagnose heart failure? Well, it's important to say that early diagnosis is, uh, is important because the earlier we find abnormal function of the heart muscle leading to symptoms, the earlier we can get started on treating it and getting people out of heart failure and then working on keeping them out of heart failure. The most common test that's ordered when heart failure is suspected is an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart. And you see a still picture of an ultrasound there. Ultrasound pictures of the heart in an echocardiogram are actually moving pictures. So we see the heart squeezing and relaxing and we see the valves opening and closing. Um, and an ultrasound is the same thing that a pregnant lady gets on her belly. So it's that ultrasound probe with some gel, if you've ever seen that done before on a pregnant mom. It's a pretty easy test to get done. It's non-invasive. It doesn't take more than about 20 minutes or so. It's not something everybody needs. It's something that's only ordered if we suspect this diagnosis. Uh, it can also be ordered for a number of other ways to evaluate other heart problems outside of a possible heart failure. So the echo test shows me, your doctor, how well the heart squeezes and how well it relaxes. Remember I mentioned systole and diastole earlier. It tells the doctor how well the valves open and close. It can tell us whether you were born with any congenital anatomic heart abnormalities that you might not know about because we don't always know that there's an abnormal part of the heart in the way it developed inside mom's belly. But those abnormalities can lead to problems later in life. Uh, and it can also look for any evidence of previous damage from something like a heart attack, a blocked coronary artery that's led some of the heart muscle to not squeeze as well. And that ejection fraction that I, measure, that I mentioned on the last slide is measured in an echocardiogram. And, and in the simplest terms, what an ejection fraction tells us is how well the heart's pumping. It looks at how big the heart gets during the relaxing phase and how small it gets during the squeezing phase and compares those two sizes to get a sense of how much blood is ejected each time the heart squeezes compared to how much blood fills the heart before the ejection. So in a healthy heart, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the ejection fraction at a normal range is between about 55 and 70 percent. So when we talk about now how we treat heart failure, this is sort of getting into the next phase of the talk. Uh, the first thing I want to mention and one of the things I want you to remember is, like I said earlier, you can get out of heart failure after you're diagnosed with it. So people with heart failure can live normal lives, normal length of life, and have normal quality of life. There are certain medications and certain devices and therapies that have been shown in trials that we do to be able to increase the likelihood that your life is prolonged, that you lead a normal lifespan compared to people your age. Uh, and these trials have also shown that certain medicines or devices or therapies can improve symptoms and function in day-to-day -day life and thus improve quality of life. And more importantly, that once you get out of heart failure, these treatments can hopefully help to prevent you from going back into heart failure, can maybe even sometimes re-strengthen the heart and it definitely try and stop that heart failure from worsening or becoming a bigger problem in your life. Now still important, although we're going to talk about medicines and devices and therapies, is that eating healthy, exercising regularly, and keeping your weight in the normal range are really important ways to keep the heart de-stressed and to minimize the chance that you develop heart disease as life goes on. So, um, I should mention briefly that there are different types of heart failure. I mentioned earlier systolic heart failure, a problem with the squeeze, weakening of the squeeze, and diastolic heart failure, a problem with uh, inability of the heart to relax because it's too stiff. And so we should say that different types of heart failure are treated differently. There are more types of heart failure outside of these two, or more causes of each of these two types of heart failure, and many causes of heart failure might be treated differently by your own doctor. Uh, but I at least want to mention with these two, again, systolic heart failure, a problem with the squeeze, and diastolic heart failure, a problem with the relaxation of the heart. Both of these are really common, and the incidence, the frequency with which we see patients with these two kinds of heart failure is about 50-50 in the U.S. population. So about half of people with heart failure have systolic, and about half have diastolic heart failure. But each is treated differently. We're going to focus a little bit more on systolic heart failure, if for no other reason than because we just have a lot more science behind how to treat it well. We know that there are things that can help to improve longevity and symptom control. With diastolic heart failure, we're still working really hard in the labs and in our science to figure out how to help patients better, but we just don't know as much. 
So when we talk about medications for systolic heart failure, here's a list of different classes of medicines we use, and I'm going to go through each of these in a little bit of detail. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much data, uh, but I'll go through each of those. What I will mention about diastolic heart failure is that some of the same classes of medicines are used and have been shown to help people feel better and hopefully keep people out of the hospital. But until very recently, none have been shown to improve longevity, to increase your chance for survival for a nice, long, normal lifespan. And that's kind of the, one of the most important metrics we use to judge whether a treatment is successful in a given condition in how we study uh, disease in, in science, in medicine in, in America today. Um, so uh, there is this medicine called SGLT2 inhibitors. I'm going to talk about them when I talk about systolic heart failure treatments. They're kind of one of the new kids on the block for medicines we use to treat heart failure, and they are the very first medicine that we think, although studies are still ongoing, may actually have what we call a mortality benefit in diastolic heart failure, problems with a stiff heart muscle that doesn't fill well. Past that, we're not going to talk too much about diastolic heart failure treatment today. What I will say is that people who, die, who have diastolic heart failure oftentimes succumb to other medical conditions because they oftentimes have a number of other conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity. People who have systolic heart failure tend to succumb to systolic heart failure. Um, so the focus is really on how to treat that systolic heart failure. So I'm just going to, like I said, briefly go through some of those classes of medicines. The first class and some of you may be on these for other reasons, because we use these medicines for more than just heart failure. The first class is called ACE inhibitors. Uh, they end, all of them, the generic names end in P-R-I-L, PRIL. And so you see here the generic name listed first, and in parentheses is what we call the brand name for each of these drugs. So these are blood pressure lowering medicines. They can be used for people with high blood pressure without heart failure. But they've also been shown to help relax the, uh, the blood vessels, which tend to get really tight and squeeze really tight when the heart starts, stops pumping well and the heart muscle gets weak. And so by dilating blood vessels, these medicines, although they sometimes lower blood pressure, can help to, the heart to pump forward more effectively when it's struggling to do so. Um, and they can improve survival by a quarter to 50%, so a really strong medicine uh, in treatment of systolic heart failure. They were the first class of agents that we ever found through trials help uh, outcomes in heart failure patients. Um, and they can delay the onset of heart failure symptoms in people who don't have heart failure yet. So, for example, if you have high blood pressure and your doctor prescribes an ACE inhibitor like, say, lisinopril, you might actually be getting some benefit in preventing heart fail failure in the future. A very closely related uh, medicine uh, to ACE inhibitors are angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs for short, and they all end in this uh, ending of, uh, of S-A-R-T-A-N, so valsartan, candesartan, losartan. And these are sort of like cousins of ACE inhibitors. They work in a very similar mechanism to ACE inhibitors to dilate blood vessels and help the heart pump fl blood forward more effectively. They've also been showed to improve survival in patients with systolic heart failure. And oftentimes, patients on ACE inhibitors can develop a well-known side effect of a cough, and when that happens, we can switch them to an ARB, and then they don't have a cough anymore most often. Uh, and these medicines have the same similar, or, excuse me, the same potential side effects uh, to ACE inhibitors, things like stressing out the kidneys or lowering blood pressure, but again, they don't cause the cough. Uh, and then uh, there is a newer medicine that's a combination of an ARB, Valsartan, and Secubitril. And that combination pill is called Entresto, and you've probably seen commercials about it. It's one of the newest medicines we have available. So it's a combination pill. And it um, was uh, just about five years ago or so, six years ago, was shown to have a benefit above and beyond being on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker in heart failure. Uh, so it's an exciting medicine that we oftentimes add. So no one needs to be on more than one of these three medicines. You would be on either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And now we try and get people on Entresto instead of the other two because it might be a little bit better. Just like all newer medicines, Entresto is more costly and it can be more difficult to get it covered by your insurance, but that's something your doctor and team, and team can help you with if it's the right medicine for you. Um, so the next class of medicines are called beta blockers. And uh, beta blockers are uh, one of the oldest blood pressure medicines we have out there. They also lower heart rate. And they are the second uh, kind type of medicine that was shown to be helpful in people with systolic heart failure. So we're, they're one of the first medicines we try and get people on. Again, you can see here that they can improve heart function over time. They can improve your chances at survival, li living a nice, nice long lifespan when you have systolic heart failure. The thing to know about beta blockers, uh, which again, you may be on for other reasons like blood pressure, uh, too high of blood pressure or abnormal heart rhythms. The thing to know about these is that sometimes when you first start on them with heart failure, they can actually make your symptoms slightly worse before they start to make them better. Uh, 
we also know, because I prescribe these medicines a lot, that of all the medicines I'm talking about, beta blockers have the highest likelihood of making people, people feel worse when they start them. They just make people feel sort of blah. Uh, so it's important to know that and talk with your doctor about it. It's important to not ever give up on the medicine without talking to your doctor first. But it's always good to know that with these medicines, there can be some symptoms. They usually get better with time, and they can start when you start the medicine. We can see those medicines flare up again when the medicine dose is increased. Um, when we talk about uh, aldosterone blockers, these are yet another blood pressure lowering class of medicines, like these other ones I've mentioned, that have been shown to be helpful in heart failure. And there are two of these, spironolactone and iplerinone, are the two generic names. The brand names are there in parentheses. And these are added to the other two medicines, either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or now Entresto as one medicine, and a beta blocker as the second medicine. This medicine can be added as a third agent, it is a weak water pill, or what we call a diuretic. It doesn't cause you to have a lot of extra urination. It can lower blood pressure, though not as well as the other medicines I've mentioned. But it has been shown to improve survival in certain patients with a weak heart muscle, though not all. So you may develop systolic heart failure, but you may not get put on this medicine by your doctor, depending on certain specific details about your heart failure. The other thing to know about these medicines is like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin recept receptor blockers and Entresto, they can stress the kidneys out. They can do that even more so. So sometimes when people have kidney disease, in addition to systolic heart failure, we're not able to use this class of medicines. Uh, the next class of medicines are the newest one I told you about. So we now have four drugs that we recommended for all people with systolic heart failure, either an ACE or an ARB or Entresto. That's number one. Beta blockers, number two. Those aldosterone blockers number three, and now these, SGLT2 inhibitors. And if you'll remember, I told you that these are the only medicine that we think may also have a survival benefit in people with the other kind of heart failure, diastolic heart failure, a stiff heart muscle that doesn't fill well. So this is a really exciting new class of medications for us because new classes don't come along often that have a really big benefit in our patients. These medicines, uh, which the generic name ends in a very uh, difficult to say ending, gliflozin, and you've probably seen commercials for these too because they're new and so the pharma companies are really kind of shilling them these days. Uh, Farsiga, Jardiance, and Invokana are the brand names for these medications. So these are actually a pill originally created for people with diabetes, high blood sugar, and they can help to lower blood sugar. But what we found, which was a nice surprise is that they can also help people with heart failure in the same way that those other three classes of medicines can help people to have a chance of living longer lives and having better quality of life staying out of the hospital having their heart failure stay controlled so even though this is a diabetes pill we have now tested it in non-diabetics and it can be used if you don't have diabetes it doesn't cause any risks of low blood sugar or anything like that and unlike the other three classes of medicines SGLT2 inhibitors are the only systolic heart failure medicine that doesn't lower blood pressure so that's rare and it's a plus because sometimes when we're trying to get people with systolic heart failure on all these medicines, we run out of blood pressure room. Uh, so this is one we can put on even with low blood pressure. The only side effect that's known with these medicines is an increased risk of yeast infections, genital mycotic infections. And so for women who have frequent yeast infections, sometimes this isn't a safe medicine to use. Again, just like I mentioned with Entresto, that combination pill, uh, these medicines are new, and so they can be more costly as far as your co-pays, or sometimes the insurance still isn't covering them yet, especially in non-diabetics. So this would be something you would talk to and work with your doctor and, and his or her team about. There are other medicines that have much more narrow indications. We don't use them on everyone. So there are these medicines we call vasodilators, and specifically it's two medicines that we use together. Again, both blood pressure lowering medicines. Uh, isosorbide dinitrate, kind of a mouthful. The brand name is Isodil, And then a medicine, a really old medicine called hydralazine, also a blood pressure lowering medicines, medicine. Sometimes we use this combination of pills in people who can't be on ACE inhibitors or ARBs or Entresto because their kidney function isn't normal. Uh, these medicines don't affect the kidneys. They do lower blood pressure. Uh, one of the downsides is that they have to be dosed three times a day. So that's quite frequent to have to take a pill, which can be a pain. And these medicines specifically have been shown to help improve survival in African-American patients who are already on the other medicines that I mentioned. Then we have a number of medicines that haven't been shown to improve the chance at survival and leading a nice long normal lifespan. So they may not be quite as effective in systolic heart failure, but they can still make you feel better from day to day or keep you out of the hospital. And those include diuretics, uh, medicines that make you pee, medicines like furosemide or Lasix and other uh, closely related medicines to that, 
a very old medicine called digoxin, which can help to lower the heart rate and keep you out of the hospital. And then a medicine called Ivabradine, the brand name is Corlinor. That's a medicine from just about seven years ago that can also lower heart rate and keep people out of the hospital. So these are medicines that not everybody is on and that the doctors may push a little less to get someone on with systolic heart failure if their symptoms are controlled on the first four classes I mentioned. But sometimes these will be added to help control symptoms or try to keep improving uh, long-term prognosis with systolic heart failure. The most important thing probably to know about medicines is that with most medicines we try to increase the dose as much as possible because higher doses have been shown to be more effective in trying to keep the heart strength, keep the heart strong, keep it supported, uh, and keep you living a nice long life. But it's important also to know that more is always better until it's not. So I mentioned to you that a lot of these medicines lower blood pressure. and. Just like all medicines, these medicines can have side effects. So sometimes increasing those doses can be limited. And this is one of those places where I feel like it's really important to say that it, you've got to talk to your doctor and your team of healthcare providers. You've got to tell us if you think a medicine is making you feel better or if it's making you feel worse. And I also want to encourage you to always give things a good try. Develop a trusting relationship with your doctor. Give something a try. And even if it causes problems early, if the doctor asks you to give it a try, keep trying it. Uh, because sometimes if you give up too soon, you may not take the medicine long enough to realize the side effect can go away and you can realize the benefit. The bottom line here is that communication with and trust in your doctor is more important than any pill or any procedure or any therapy that you undergo. Uh, and that requires you and your doctor to communicate. So other things outside of medicines, uh, exercise therapy. We know exercise is good for the heart, and even a weak heart still should exercise. It's good for a weak heart, and it's safe for a weak heart to exercise. Specifically, there is a structured exercise and education program that's been tested called cardiac rehab uh, that sometimes people qualify for. Most insurances will cover it for most patients with heart failure, at least one round of cardiac rehab, which is a number of, uh, of sessions in a cardiac rehab facility, and St. Luke's does have one of these. And cardiac rehab, the structured exercise and education program, has been shown to improve muscle tone, increase bone mass, to make it easier to do activities of daily living. Uh, it helps people understand what thresholds they can keep as far as things like weight training, how they can safely incorporate different ways of exercise without overstressing the heart or putting themselves at risk. And cardiac rehab has been shown to improve quality of life and survival, just like all the medicines I mentioned. Uh, more importantly, I think there's a nice educational component to the cardiac rehab program where you learn about diet, exercise, lifestyle, so that you can confidently navigate your world even with a diagnosis of heart failure. And finally, a more intangible maybe hard to see benefit, but one that I experience or have seen patients experience is that you go through cardiac rehab with other people like you, people who are coping with heart failure, heart disease, heart attacks. And by meeting others who share your experience and socializing with them, I think it gets easier to feel like you're not alone when you develop symptoms or, di or get diagnoses of things like heart failure. Self-management is also important. I'm not going to talk about this too much, uh, but it's important to restrict how much salt you take in. In general, the rule is that salt uh, is that water follows salt in the body. So the more salt you eat, the more water you're going to retain. And when your heart is already weakened and not pumping blood forward well, or when it's stiff and not letting blood in, you're already retaining fluid. And so eating a bunch of salt will cause you will cause that to get even worse. So it's important to read labels, look at goal intake of sodium per day for your weight and your gender, and try to make sure that you cue to a safe, heart-healthy diet. Uh, we oftentimes ask our heart failure patients to weigh themselves daily and to look for certain gains, like more than two pounds in a day or more than five pounds in a week. That can be that fluid retention building up. Like I mentioned on the last slide, we do encourage exercise, even with a weak heart muscle. There's very seldom a case where we tell a patient not to exercise. And the last thing is the importance of vaccinations. There have been great studies that have shown that patients with heart failure are more at risk for dying from things like influenza or pneumonia. And we now know that we can lump COVID into this. So getting vaccinated yearly against influenza, getting vaccinated once or twice in your life against pneumonia, depending on your doctor's recommendation. And so far, getting vaccinated with a two series uh, shot for COVID and in certain patient populations now getting a booster uh, have been shown to be helpful in preventing problems in patients with heart failure who are at higher risk for complications of these infections because of their weak heart muscles. Uh, there are a number of other medical conditions and diagnoses that can impact or worsen your heart failure. And so here's a list of those here. Um, 
In general, uh, we want you seeing a cardiologist if you have heart failure, but you should have a primary care doctor and sometimes more specialists if you have a significant disease or chronic conditions of other organ systems. Um, the last thing I want to say, and probably a really important thing, although something that's not as much about science or hard data, is that it's really important that you talk about your disease if you have heart failure, how it affects your life, and what your goals are in your life, and how heart failure may hamper them or affect them. I want you to talk to your doctor and your healthcare team. I want you to talk to your family and your friends and the people that you love and that love you and that are invested in your care and in your longevity. Talking to a spiritual advisor or a counselor if that's something that's helpful for you. And talking to yourself. Uh, I think that thinking and talking about your health and your health conditions and your health challenges now, when you're feeling well, if that's the time you're in, can help to simplify and clarify and ease difficult decisions that can come later as we get nearer to the end of life, as we age or as our diseases become harder to control. Um, it's important to make plans now for what you would do or what you would want or what matters to you if or when you get sick in the future or if or when you approach the end of life. Um, and I encourage patients to try and plan based on their own values and goals and preferences. Now it's important to know that those plans are going to change, right? They're going to change as you get older. They're going to change as you go through different experiences. So after you've had this initial round of thoughts and talks with the people that matter in your life and with your healthcare team, I want to encourage you to revisit and reevaluate periodically whatever goals you've set forth, whether it's in an advanced directive or setting up a durable power of attorney or stipulating with the people that matter to you in your life what you would and wouldn't want done for you to try and keep you alive if you get into tough Heart, uh, situations due to your heart failure. Things change and so you should continue to revisit these ideas because your goals and values and preferences might change. Uh, and finally, like I said, share those plans with the people that matter. If you know, they should know. That's how I think of it. The last thing we're going to do briefly is touch on devices and remote monitoring for heart failure. Um, there are a couple therapies that have been shown to improve survival and outcomes in people with heart failure. One of them is called cardiac resynchronization therapy or CRT. This is something that is sometimes added on to a pacemaker or a defibrillator, different kinds of implantable devices some patients get. It's important to know that not everyone with systolic heart failure needs a pacemaker or a defibrillator, so you may develop systolic heart failure, but you may, it, never, it may never be recommended you need a device like this. This CRT therapy, what it does is it synchronizes squeezing of both the right and left sides of the heart. Sometimes when the heart gets sick, one side, the chambers will squeeze just slightly before the other, and that dyssynchrony throws everything off because that circulatory system we talked about at the beginning is a closed loop, and so blood needs to flow continuously, and anything that causes dyssynchrony in that pattern can, uh, can cause worsening of forward flow or backup of flow causing congestion. Like I said, this is appropriate only for patients with certain findings, and we use findings on the EKG to see if someone has significant dyssynchrony between the left and the right side of the heart squeezing. And in those patients in whom it's indicated, not all patients benefit. So improving symptoms and decreasing hospital admissions only happens in about 70% of patients who get this therapy. So this is something your doctor would tell you if they thought you were a candidate for if you have systolic heart failure. I mentioned ICDs, which are implantable cardiac defibrillators. So this is a pacemaker that specifically is constantly monitoring your heart rhythm, and it looks for an abnormal or dangerous heart rhythm that could be deadly or fatal. Uh, the ones that we often think of are the ones you see in movies VTAC or VFib that patients get shocked for. And what a ICD does, it's a pacemaker that it can actually deliver a shock to the heart. So if you go into VTAC or VFib, uh, abnormal heart rhythms that can be fatal within seconds to minutes, the device can shock you. Um, and that can sometimes be a life-saving thing. Again, not everybody who uh, has systolic heart failure needs an implantable cardiac defibrillator, so this is something your doctor would bring up and talk to you about if it was indicated. Oh, and I just would mention that it's important to know that defibrillators don't treat heart failure like the medicines that I mentioned or CRT that I just mentioned or cardiac rehab. They don't make the heart better. They don't make it stronger. ICDs are there as a safety mechanism, a backup in case the heart tries to stop or go into a dangerous rhythm. The other important thing to know is that not everybody who has an ICD recommended chooses to get one, and that's okay too. So this is an area of medicine where we know that there's data that says these devices might help certain people with systolic heart failure, but they also come with certain risks and problems, and so some people may decide not to get that device implanted, and that's okay. 
Uh, there are ways that we can monitor for fluid volume building up in the body. Um, some pacemakers or defibrillators have some science or technology inside them that tries to guess how much fluid is accumulated in the heart or in the lungs, and then this information can be relayed to the doctor's office wirelessly so that the doctor and their team can review it and try and make changes to medicines like those water pills, diuretics, to keep the fluid levels down. This technology, though, is not perfect. Um, it's much more important that we see trends over time than that we see one value, because it's really about the trend. If we see signs of fluid accumulating over multiple checks, it can be much more uh, accurate in letting us know that fluid is accumulating as, as compared to looking at the numbers once. Uh, there is a newer kind of implantable cardiac monitor uh, and this is a picture of it here, and you see it right next to a dime, so you see it's very small. The device is called a CardioMEMS, and this specifically tries to look for evidence of fluid accumulating like 10 to 14 days before a patient with heart failure would develop symptoms of that fluid accumulation. So it tries to let us know and alert us ahead of time, before the symptoms ever start, before you ever need to come to the hospital, uh, so that we can call and say, hey, looks like the pressures are going up a little bit. We need to take an extra water pill for a couple days. The idea is that with this device, sometimes we can keep people out of heart failure, keep symptoms at bay, keep you from having to get admitted to the hospital for a heart failure flare. This is a really safe uh, device once it's in, and actually it's very low risk to have it implanted. Again, this is one that not everybody needs, uh, but that your doctor may talk to you about. And it easily sends information wirelessly, just like pacemakers and defibrillators can. Uh, the last thing to mention, and I'm going to mention this briefly because there's really not a lot of science behind these, there are a number of platforms that have been created. The one you see on top, Vital Connect, you can see a, a small sticker that's shaped like a peanut, and that can be laid on top of your pacemaker or defibrillator if you have one implanted, and the doctor can grab a bunch of data from your pacemaker or defibrillator uh, and track a bunch of data, a bunch of different data points over time. The one on bottom, HeartLogic, is actually like a very small version of a pacemaker that's implanted in addition to, so it's a separate device completely from a pacemaker or a defibrillator. The idea is that these devices are trying to look at tons of different things because we can look at your daily weight or we can look at how swollen your legs are or we can look at your ejection fraction. But what we know in medicine in general is that if we look at a number of different things to try and get at whether there's a problem, the more data we look at, the more whole of a picture and well-rounded of a picture we can get of how well your, your heart failure is controlled, how much you're accumulating fluid as a, as a result of either a weak squeeze or a stiff heart muscle. So many have been created. These are two of the ones that have been the most well-tested. And to be honest, none of these systems that try to look at a number of different parameters have been shown to be really in effective in improving survival. Sometimes maybe they're better at controlling symptoms or helping people stay out of the hospital, but even that data is kind of questionable. Um, so sometimes the way I think of these platforms is that they may help us with patients who have really struggled. They keep getting admitted to the hospital. They have trouble keeping fluid off, even being compliant with their medicines and a good diet and activity levels. And in those patients, these platforms of monitoring multiple different things may help us say you're a really high risk patient and we need to be really careful about you in the upcoming week or two because it looks like you're heading for a flare and an admission to the hospital but the jury's whether out the jury's still out on whether these are really helpful I think the most important thing to know is that more is not always better when it comes to things like this. Um, and I'm not certain as a heart failure doctor that this is going to help just yet but something we're still studying. Probably more prevalent is wearables. Everybody's got an activity tracker now or a smart watch that attaches to a phone app. And we're getting more and more questions from you patients about these and what these numbers mean. I think that these can be really helpful in uh, you understanding how much activity you're doing or helping you increase your exercise to a certain goal every day. It can be helpful in moderating and tracking your diet and making sure you're keeping a heart healthy diet avoiding too much sodium intake. But I also think as a doctor who deals with patients coming in and asking questions based on data they're getting from their wearables, uh, that sometimes they can provide what the kids call TMI, too much information. So uh, doctors aren't always familiar with the device you use or the data that it yields or how it comes out or how it looks in the interface. And our guidelines that we use, kind of like our Bible for how to treat our patients, they don't really tell us to do what to do with any of this information yet. So sometimes bringing this information can be helpful and sometimes it can be overwhelming. I don't want to dissuade you from bringing that information in if you use a wearable or use an app. I think it's important to include it in the conversation with your doctor. I don't think these things can hurt. I just don't know yet if they actually 
help. And when we know there are certain things that do help, the medicines I've mentioned, the therapies I've mentioned, the devices I've mentioned, that's where I really want to focus my time. And then if there's time, I do want to talk about these things with you and help give you guidance. But I'm kind of uncertain how much I know and how much I can help you with the information these kinds of things provide. So just an important caveat for you to know. And that's what I've got for you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and answer the, some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time, ahead of the talk today. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have submitted questions in the chat during this uh, viewing, they will be addressed uh, next week when we send out a copy of these slides. So please don't hesitate to add more questions. So these are some of the ones we got earlier. Uh, first, what's the relevance of periodically occurring atrial fibrillation or skipped beats? So atrial fibrillation is the most common abnormal heart rhythm. It's an abnormal uh, problem with the conduction system in the upper two chambers of the heart. Uh, and a number of people feel things like skipped beats or palpitations. In general, it's okay to go in and out of atrial fibrillation if you have it, as long as you're on a blood thinner, uh, which protects you from stroke that can happen in the setting of atrial fibrillation. And in general, if you're having periodic skipped beats or a sensation of irregular heartbeats or palpitations, it's an important thing to tell your doctor. And oftentimes what we'll do is we'll send a monitor to your home that you can wear under your shirt for a day or three days or two weeks or a month. And that's a good way for us to look for any abnormal rhythms that need treatment. Uh, someone asked about uh, an opinion on carvedilol. That's one of those beta blockers I mentioned. And dose after aortic valve replacement. So this is someone who uh, knows someone or themselves underwent a surgical replacement of their aortic valve or a catheter-based replacement of the, of the aortic valve. There's no specific indication for carvedilol or the class of medicines called beta blockers after aortic valve replacement. Uh, but many people who have an aortic valve replacement or have had one either have systolic heart failure or they have high blood pressure. And so they may be on a beta blocker for those reasons. There are other conditions that cause the aortic valve to become pro a problem and need to be replaced that can also cause changes in the aorta, which is the large artery that all the blood that leaves the heart goes through. It's a large candy cane shaped artery that all the other arteries branch off of. And if that aorta gets diseased or dilated as a result of problems with the aortic valve, a beta blocker is oftentimes recommended to de-stress that area of blood flow and keep that aorta safe from any further damage or abnormal changes. Someone asked about the heart rate, the speed of the heart pulse, uh, and whether that can be a sign of congestive heart failure. Well, what we know is that when the heart muscle gets weak, so when we're talking about systolic heart failure specifically, when the heart muscle gets weak and it doesn't squeeze as well, it's only got one thing left that it can do to increase what we call cardiac output, or how much blood and oxygen is being pushed out from the heart, and that's to increase the heart rate. So we know that when we're young and healthy and we do a lot more exercise maybe, when we start to exercise, the heart rate goes up. That's one way to increase cardiac output, increase the amount of blood flow and oxygen supply getting to the heart, to the body parts that need more oxygen under conditions of exercise. And the other thing the heart does is when we exercise, the heart stretches further when it's filling and that causes it to squeeze back even harder when it's squeezing. Um, and that goes away when people develop systolic heart failure. The heart doesn't spring back as strongly when it gets weak and stretched and thin and dilated. And so in a patient with systolic heart failure, a high heart rate can be a concerning finding because it can be a sign that the heart's really struggling to keep up and it's doing the only thing it's got left that it can do, which is to increase the rate. Now it's really important to say that there are lots of things that cause the heart rate to go up. And so if you have a concern about high heart rates or abnormal heart rates, the most important thing to do is talk to your doctor. Uh, someone asked about uh, brain natriuretic peptide, or what we call BNP, and whether it's a reliable indicator of heart failure. So this BNP is a hormone that gets secreted from the heart muscle cells when the heart is getting stretched and dilated by extra fluid. And so it is something we use to look for evidence of heart failure in a person who maybe hasn't been diagnosed before. We know that when the heart is failing and the fluid is congesting the system, the heart chambers will get stretched out by all the extra fluid getting stuck there waiting to get through. And that will cause the heart muscle cells that are being stretched to release this BNP, which helps the body make more urine to hopefully get rid of that extra fluid. So it is an, an indicator of heart failure. Whether it's reliable is another question altogether. It can be falsely low in people who are overweight, and it can be falsely high in certain medical conditions. So while it is something we use, it's probably not something you need to worry too much about. It's one of the many tools we use to track whether we think you're having heart failure or not, or whether your heart failure is well controlled or not. 
Uh, someone asked, uh, how can I tell the difference between signs of aging and heart failure symptoms? That's a great question. I don't know that I have an easy answer. I oftentimes refer to what I call the glories of aging when I'm talking to my patients. I think I might have used that phrase earlier when I was talking about normal kinds of swelling in the legs. Um, as we get older, the body ages and all the parts of the body age, and so things work less effectively. What I tell people to really be vigilant for is a really different change or symptoms that develop that seem out of proportion to your level of physical fitness or your level of activity. Um, in general, with heart failure, I ask people to look for a constellation of symptoms. Usually it's not just one thing. Usually it's swelling in the legs, trouble breathing when you lay down at night or waking up in the middle of the night, shorter breath. Noticing that when you try to do things that you could do a year ago, you get a lot more short of breath or a lot more fatigued. Things like climbing one set of stairs that used to be easy that now really takes it out of you. Um, these are the kind of things I would want people to be looking for. And it's really important to think about the constellation of symptoms, not just one thing. Because people with heart failure tend to develop fluid accumulation in multiple places, and that leads to multiple problems or multiple symptoms. And the last question that was submitted ahead of time, aren't all natural deaths the result of heart failure? Well. The real answer is we don't know, right, because not everybody gets an autopsy. But what we know from the science that does exist is that heart disease is the number one cause of sickness and the number one cause of death in America and has been for a long, long time. And we know that there are a lot of people who, when they get to the end of life and, say, pass away in their sleep, whether we get an autopsy or not, oftentimes when people pass away in their sleep late in life, we can assume it has to do with abnormalities in the heart. The heart has beat a lot of times, trillions and trillions of times over the course of decades of life, and there are times when it simply stops. And that can be a problem with the electricity I mentioned, it can be a problem with the plumbing, it can be a problem with the mechanics, the heart muscle itself. Um, so all natural deaths are not the result of heart failure, but many natural deaths probably are the result of some cardiac process uh, stopping working in an effective way. When people die of heart failure, oftentimes we know it because they've developed symptoms for some time, the same constellation of symptoms I just mentioned. Uh, so I hope that gives good answers to those questions. I look forward to answering any other questions you send through uh, the chat today, um, and I appreciate your listening. Uh, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to our group if you have questions. I wish you the best of luck in your health care. If you do develop heart failure, please remember that this is a treatable condition. It's something that you can go into, but it's also something that you can get out of and stay out of. And that's what we're here to help you do as your healthcare team.